Hello and welcome to the Odds Checker Betting Show. This is a golf preview. It is, of course, the US PGA preview coming to you this weekend from Southern Hills Country Club. I'm your host, George Ellick, and I'm joined today by Odds Checker's golf tipster, Niall Lyons, as we look ahead to the second major uh, of the year. And Niall, you know, looking forward to it. I know you you've, you've haven't had much sleep recently, a few uh, childcare issues your end. Uh, hopefully you get some kit before a big weekend's action. Yeah, looking forward to it. Uh... It's probably the, the least favourite of all of, all the four majors for, for all of us, basically, isn't it? It's mm. sometimes hard to get excited about it. And, the ugly duckling. But, uh, I don't know, the course looks good this week. And coming back off a winner off Max Homa as well, which is very handy. So hopefully we can continue that run this week. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's, yeah, I feel like we haven't done a great job of selling it there by calling it the worst major. But you are right, though, because it does feel <laughs> like in terms of, of, of the course, you know, with the USPG and US Open, of course, and well, and the Open Championship, you have uh, the course changing every year. And in, in Southern Hills, we've got a course that we haven't seen for a major championship for, for quite some time. And it seems to have had a fair few changes in, in terms of the way that it's, the, the test that it's going to provide to these players, uh, the aesthetic of the course as well. So I think before we talk about your picks and before we, we look at some others in the market as well, we always have to tackle you know, what challenge is the course going to gonna create for these players? What kind of players are we looking at? What what um, And what stats, what data points are the ones to, to focus in on if you're looking to make your own picks rather than uh, necessarily following yourself or, or other tipsters in? Yeah, well, as I say, there are, you know, I probably don't give it as much credit. As, you know, last year's KOA Island, they, they got it really right. You know, that was probably yeah. one of my favourite majors in a long time. Mm. And, you know, it suited... Uh, you know the older, more experienced types. So as we've seen, obviously Mickelson winning and Harrington and Casey and all in the mix as well. So last year it was absolutely tremendous. So hopefully we get similar. Although the course is a lot different, obviously, uh, and it has changed an awful lot since 2007, since Tiger won there. Uh, there's been a Gil Hans redesign in the last couple of years, and he kind of reverts the bunkers back to you know what. The, they were kind of meant to be it was just more rugged and more natural looking and uh of course it's been lengthened a couple of hundred yards as you would expect from 2007 but now it plays is just just over three seven thousand three hundred yards par 70 which is a it's going to be a real stretch for these golfers especially with the wind that's forecast this week there's a fair amount of wind forecast on thursday friday and saturday mm. so uh hopefully that that contributes to a real interest in championship it usually does it sometimes <clears throat> contributes to slightly more strange results uh with the win but nevertheless uh i think we have to start looking at uh a good short game i think inevitably greens will be missed the greens are very small around southern hills uh compared to other major championship golf courses so i think well you know, a par 70 at 7,300 yards plus, it's going to be, there's going to be greens missed anyway, but throw in the wind, and I think we'll have plenty of missed greens. Uh, I think 75% roughly was, was the top the greens in regulation back in 2007, and I would suspect that'll be even lower this week. So I think short game's going to come into it. There's There's been uh, shaved runoffs, you know, there was high rough around the greens in 2007, or in 2007, but that's been changed now to you know shaved runoff. So uh, chipping around the greens will be from tight lies, and I, you kind of think it's almost similar to Augusta in many ways. That you know we're looking at you know long, long straight drivers that got mind you the fairways have been widened as well. I must mention that mm. you know roughly around 40 yards wide on average, which is quite big for a major championship of this size. Normally in the last number of years we've seen long, tough golf courses on these US major championships that have suited the, you know, the bomb and gouge tactics where you could just hit it anywhere and get as close to the green as possible. This is slightly more nuanced, this place where there's dog legs, there's you know, there's four or five par fours that are actually under uh, 450 yards. Uh, but there's room off the tee. So I think it'll suit, you know, obviously the big hitters as per usual, but the inevitable greens miss will put pressure on the short game from tight lies, which sounds an awful lot like Augusta in many ways. Mm. So uh, I think we're looking almost as a sim similar uh, test almost on paper than, you know, the last month. 
That makes me happy to hear you, you say that because I am um, looking at my own bets for this week. It was a bit weird how similar they were to my Augusta bets. So it's a bit of a relief to hear you say that there is some correlation uh, between the two this year. And just finally, before we kind of move on to your picks, um, looking back at 2007, I think, you know, you mentioned there that the, the, the changes of the course um, and the, you know, the differences, especially in terms of, of the runoffs to the green as well, and how that's going to be different to 2007. Would you say that therefore looking back, at the leaderboard uh, that weekend, the Tiger winning uh, two clear of, of Woody Austin with Ernie Els back in, back three back, and then a, a, a kind of big gap to anyone else below. Is there no real point? Is this is this basically a different test at a different in a, in a different era? Yeah, I think it's a totally different test. To be fair, now granted, Tiger and Ernie were were you know two of the biggest hitters in the game back then. Um, obviously Woody Austin wasn't. He was a totally different type of golfer. But I think there's room for both, for all types of golfers to contend here, to be fair, which is, you know, decent. That You know, US PGA Championships have always suited the big hitters down, down these last five to ten years. Uh, but I definitely do think there's room for, you know, one who, you know, I might not mention later on in the preview, but just didn't quite make the cut into my selections was Corey Connors. And someone mm-hmm. who hits an awful lot of greens in, re- in regulation will, you know, probably play rail around here and Corey Connors has some decent major experience in the last couple of years going close to the Masters a couple of times so yeah there's I think there's room for all types of golfers here so uh, you look back at 2007 there's not much to glean from it it is a totally different course but once again we'll probably will see uh, the biggest hitters in the game on top of the leaderboard come Sunday evening Okay, well, let's get into the picks then. Um, you've got six selections. These haven't even been published up on the Odds Checker uh, app or on site either yet. So these are hot off the press as we speak. But apologies if that means that some of the prices do go. We do know that Niall is there. Yeah, it's an influencer when it comes to these betting markets these days. So the prices may be clipped in in places. But do download the Odds Checker app because there you will find the best prices at all times and the best place terms. Very important. We've got on the odds checker grids, um, everything ranging from a quarter of the five places to even a fifth to 11 with, with ball sports, uh, a couple of firms, 10 as well. So do check that out. And you can find Niall's tips ahead of this weekend, through the weekend and, uh, and and in the future events over the course of the season up on the app as well. So do download that now. Uh, <clears throat> two tips, basically one win only, one each way, but you're staking the most on a player who was on many people's shortlist for the Masters, uh, he looked to be the closest player to challenge Scotty Scheffler until he was the latest player to be scuppered by the 12th uh, on, on, the, on the Sunday at Augusta, uh, hitting a couple of balls into the water. But he is, what, double the price here, near, near enough? Um, he's best price out there, 25 to 1. That's six places. I think you're taking the, the 22s, aren't you, to, to get a few extra places as well? Cameron Smith, yeah. I should say. Cameron Smith. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, 22 to 1, nine places, yes. Uh yeah, I'm quite keen on him. I, I was, I was quick to dismiss him at, at when we talked just before the Masters, uh, simply because of his price. I would, I, could, I couldn't invest in his price at all, and you know he put on a great performance, and you know now we're seeing almost double the price on the exchange mm-hmm. than what he was that that week, which is strange for me because, you know that that was one of his biggest major performances yet. And in the heat of battle, obviously, in the final group on Sunday, which I think is a, a massive experience for someone like Smith, uh, you know, as a platform to go on to win a major. I think he is ready now. He obviously won at Sawgrass earlier on in the year. Uh, but I think we know now that his game travels so well to almost any layout. Uh, he's won around Wailai in Hawaii, which is, you know, quite tight off the tee. Uh Maybe not quite as tight as Sawgrass where he won, but and then he's obviously won at Kapalua as well, you know, in January. There and the, that's the widest fairways on the PGA mm-hmm. Tour, so uh, he can play basically anywhere. And his win at Sawgrass was very impressive. Obviously, it came from the right side of the draw at Sawgrass, which was very biased that week, which must be mentioned. But nevertheless, you know, when he went into the water in the seventy second. Went, went under pressure from Keegan Bradley, who had posted a score, and then he got up and down from 70 yards. You know, he stiffed that shot. That it was an, an incredible show of, you know, guts and nerves to win a championship like that when it when all it was slipping through his fingers at the last minute when he had been control of it all day. Uh, so I was very impressed by that. And then the price just didn't interest me at the Masters, but 
he got within one shot of Scotty Scheffler after two holes on the final day. And if you remember, just on the third hole, Scheffler was, you know, long odds on to bogey the third after being short of the green and two. And obviously chipped in for a birdie and then Cam Smith duffed his chip and made a mess of that hole. And, you know, where Smith looked like grabbing the lead there in the third hole, you know, it just totally changed. There was basically a two or three shot swing and it was back to three. And the, the kind of life was sucked out of Smith then that Sunday. But uh, you have to think that uh, I've talked obviously about Augusta being a similar game toward. I, th- I think a similar game will, will play mm-hmm. out here and, and do well at Southern Hills. Uh, he's won his PJ, his home PJ Championship in Australia back to back in 2017 and 2018. I think that'll prove vital if he's in the stretch once again. You know that's a big uh, feather in his cap for for an Australian. So uh, I've, I've obviously mentioned short game. I think there will be inevitable miss greens around here, and there's not many better in the game uh, on or around the greens than Cameron Smith. It's absolutely flying in that in that department this year and in other years. Uh, he he went to Harbour Town after the Masters and there was kind of a blip there, especially in a short game, which uh, is a surprise. But nevertheless, it was a week after the Masters and you, you can you can forgive him that after the grind he had gone through uh, yeah. the previous weekend. We've only seen him at, at the Zurich since alongside Mark Leishman. They finished twenty first, which was a quiet enough uh, performance there. But I suppose you can't read too much into a team event. Uh, I would rather he had got an out, uh, another outing there in the last couple of weeks, maybe. But nevertheless, I think the twenty-two to one's a, a, a great price now, considering you know he was up there in the Masters all week and he was you know basically a twelve to one shot that week. So yeah, I'm quite excited about that price. Yeah, twenty-two to one. Uh, oh well, isn't the best price, but it's the best price with the place terms as well. Um, 22 to 1, you're getting nine places with William Hill, I think might be the best at 22s. Um, so that could be the way to play it. Uh, not a couple of other eight, eight places, 365 and a couple of others too there. So Cameron Smith, 2.5 points each way, five point state. The headline pick, now for your win only pick. And I feel like, Niall, if you don't mind me saying, you're a bit of a glutton for punishment here. 16 to 1 best price, three point win, Rory McIlroy. I'll say no more. <laughs> I think it's been a while, as far as I remember, since I back in a major championship. But nevertheless, I think maybe everyone thinks that I do tip them up in every single major. <laughs> you know, contrary to popular belief, that actually doesn't happen. It's been a while since I back in the thing. But uh, I think, you know, I, I have mentioned Augusta before, obviously, and he's got a great record there, obviously, without winning. But, uh, you know, if you remember him holding out from the bunker on the 72nd there, no, I'll never forget followed, it. Followed in by Morikawa a couple of moments later. You know, could potentially be a turning point in, in his major career. You know, he's obviously fretted about these major championships for a long time now. And, you know, he hasn't really got one in a fair way. Obviously, he finished second at the Masters, but he wasn't, he was never really in it. Uh, but you have to think that that could be a turning point. He mentioned that he had never been as happy on the golf course than when he held that bunker shot. I think it was such a, an unbelievable final round of golf that lit up, you know, what was otherwise a, a rather drab master Sunday with Sheffer maybe always in control from the third holder. But I think, you know, he's come to a point now where things just might be aligning perfectly. You know, he's played very well since uh, with a second and a fifth, or, or with a fifth place championship, sorry, after, after the runner up there at Wells Fargo, which was a great preparation, I think, for this. You know, TPC at Avenel played really tough that week. There was tough conditions. Obviously, the weather was was poor too. But I think around eight, eight under won that with Max Homa and McElroy was four back in, in fifth. But it was a great effort. He was uh, 10th off the tee and 12th on approach that week, but crucially topped the greens and regulation stats. So he was first in greens and regulation that week. And that's huge going into this week. Uh, if you're going to hit, you know, if McElroy can land around 70% greens and regulation this week, he's going to have a huge chance. A short game around the greens has been great, Nick, all year round, mm. uh, which some may refute that, but. It is. People just think, you know, he struggles around the greens. 
Now, as Putten has, has been in and out all season, as it often is with McElroy, uh, but it was good last time out at the Wells Fargo, so I'm hoping that continues. Uh, so I think he's just maybe ready to win another major now. Uh, this and St Andrews will hold a massive chance for him this year, and I think he'll really fancy take him down another one. And you know, this might uh, maybe hoped for a slightly bigger price, but his golf since the Masters has been impressive enough too. So uh, you can't really expect much more than that. But I think the course will really, really suit him. And the room off the tee, you know, forty yards of you know average width of fairways is huge for McIlroy I think at a major championship you know he's not the most accurate off the tee but you know he hits a great ball when he can open his shoulders and uh, I think that'll could serve as the difference just that extra bit of room off the tee you know you consider the likes of sawgrasses are just over 30 yards uh, average uh, width fairway I mean, we're getting 40 here, so I think that makes a slight bit of difference. And um, yeah, I'm hoping that you know he just continues that good feeling after the final hole at the Masters. We were you surprised off the back of how incredible that round was, and I agree. I mean, I think it was going into Sunday, I was pretty frustrated at having what looked like quite a boring afternoon or evening's golf to watch, and it turned out to be one of the best Master Sundays I've ever seen purely because we got to watch one of yeah. the the best, uh, putting in one of the greatest rounds of golf I think I've ever watched. But, Pretty much shot for shot. Um, do you surprised he kind of took a month off? And obviously he went to Wells Fargo and, and played very well and finished fifth. But off the back of, as you say, him saying that it was the most fun he'd ever have on a golf course, it was a bit odd to not see him go out and kind of try and, and press on after that, showing that kind of sparkle on, on the Sunday. Well, I think since, you know, obviously the week after was the heritage. You know, he, it's, a, it's a course that, you know, Harbour Town wouldn't really suit McElroy. No. Yeah. You know, a, after that, you had... The team event in Zurich, which is of no interest to McElroy. Then you've got Mexico, which you know is a bit of travelling. Um, yeah, yeah. Fine. Not, so then, then after that, you've only got the Wales Fargo and the Baron Nelson. Might not have wanted to play the week before, so takes you know the Wales Fargo, and it was a good, a really good decision for me. Like that was a such a tough test, tee to green. You know, where he had under par wins. I think we'll probably look at similar scores this week, maybe a bit better if you know whatever on the conditions but uh, it was a really tough grind that week and I think that's the perfect preparation those who went to the Baron Nelson and played you know it was much easier I think the guys who played uh, at TPC Avenel will have a slight advantage if that was their their warm-up so yeah I'm delighted with the preparation to be honest superb uh, on then to your third pick uh, on the card uh, looking at a player who, um, yeah, I was certainly, I certainly backed and got some each way returns in at the Masters. Has a, a stellar Masters record, still yet to win though, of course. But it's not going to be long until we, we have to wait until Will Zalatoris finally does lift a trophy. And no reason or Niall why it can't be uh, this weekend. He's best price out there, forty to one. But again, that's a quarter of the five. You can get a bit of thirty-three to one. Uh, I think is is best price with eight places at the moment. Yeah. You know, it's a slightly risky one, obviously, that he hasn't uh, he hasn't won on tour yet. But it must be said that he looks as likely to get a win in one of these major championships than it does mm. in any, you know, even a standard PGA Tour event. Uh, he's, he has a runner-up, two sixth-place finishes, and an eighth-place finish and a master. So five top eights, in, uh, or sorry, four top eights and seven major appearances. That's, you know, unbelievable for a maiden. And, you know, just unbelievable for anyone really starting out in major championship golf. Uh, outside of those efforts, you've got second and seventh at Torrey Pines, which is another example of a long, tough golf course that, you know, just really suits Will Zalatoris. Uh, he ranks second this season uh, behind John Rahm and Stroke Screen and Tita Green, which, you know, I pointed out in a, a trans preview just there a couple of weeks ago that, you know, Strokes game Tita Green is always a stat, you know, that holds up in these uh, US major championships at these long courses. So uh, that's a big plus. It's obviously sh- the problems lie in the short game and in particular on the greens. But, you know, that doesn't particularly bother me short or long term. Uh, you know, Morikawa's putter was a big weakness until it wasn't. Um, you know, 
Hovland's shipping game will be a weakness until it isn't. You know what I mean? These guys are super talented that they'll overcome these. They'll get better in those departments too, but they'll overcome it. Their, their game's that good in other departments that, you know, it'll outweigh the weaknesses. And, you know, you only need one good week in the right greens, you know, to get your major championship. And you only need one, Hovland only needs one good week around the greens and, and grind and, you know, power putts. To win his major championship, I, and also you, you mentioned his major record. I, I think I'm right in saying that the the U.S. Open last year is the only major he's played in where he's lost, where he's dropped shots, strokes gained, put, strokes gained putting. So there's obviously something in there yeah. where he is able to step up his game, the weakest part of his game when it really matters. Yeah, absolutely. And he was tremendous there again last time out at the Masters. I think he was in mm. he was inside the top twenty. I think anyway, you know, on the green. So yeah, it's not, if it's he brought his normal approach play, he probably would have finished a bit, a bit closer. You know, because he was yeah, only... ab- absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're getting around the same price again uh, than what he was at the Masters. He wasn't he wasn't much bigger at the Masters that week, so uh, I think it's a decent enough price and, and one, one worth gambling on. He fits the bill of those American uh, powerhouses who have won this PGA, you know, down the last 10 years, and it has been dominated a fair bit by American golfers recently. So, uh, yeah, Will Salator fits the bill. Obviously still a maiden. Will he get his first win? You know, from his major championship, you know, it's a big ask. But as I say, you know, when we looked at Tony Finau down the last couple of years, you know, when it, when he before he got that second win, we were always yeah. saying, you know, a major championship is as likely for a second win, uh, you know, as any other event. And I think the same applies here for Sal Torres that, you know, his maiden victory could easily become easily be in a major championship. And he seems to not only do the long. Yes, major championship of course will suit him. You know, he seems to, as you say, raise his game for these. I wasn't going to mention this because he said that 2007 didn't matter. But skipping back for a second to Cameron Smith, just looking at the leaderboard, because of what you said there about Americans dominating, I did notice that John Sendon, Jeff Ogilvy, Stuart Appleby, Adam Scott, and Nathan Green all finished in the top 25, all Aussies. So you know, maybe you want to reverse your uh, the way you, the way you think about whether or not 2007. Yeah, well, then, then again, you know, you look at the you know the Aussie PGA down the years has often been played on a lot of wind as well, and yeah. you know, there's always wind forecast here at Southern Hills. I can't remember whether it was actually windy that week in 2007, but uh, there's definite there's a definite chance that uh, you know the same plays out this week, and Aussies are always good in the wind. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, on then to your next pick, and it's a player who we haven't seen since the Masters. Uh, we said that Will Zalatoris had a had an okay weekend on the green. The not on the greens, the same cannot be said for Brooks Kepka, who had an absolute horror show uh, with the flat stick and ended up missing the cut in the Masters. Haven't seen him since. But as is often the case, when Brooks Kepka hits these kind of numbers in in the market in a major championship, uh, he's always going to be fairly popular. And he's uh, fifty to one best price. That's uh, again a quarter of the five with sport nation but 45 to one with a couple of firms uh, and 40 to one who are giving out extra places as well yeah i'm surprised he's drifted to that number you know obviously <coughs> we, haven't seen, we haven't seen him since the masters so you'd expect a slight drift you know i backed him win only at the masters at 20 to one that was the biggest price you could get that week you know he was a general 16 or 18 to one shot with the places uh as you say he actually his long game wasn't it wasn't fair and like again which was the gamble you know uh which is why we were gambling on him, but simply because you know he played that well at the Valspar uh, a few weeks previous to the Masters, finishing 12th there, then topped his group at the at the match play. So he played, he, you know, he, he was playing good golf in the run up to the mm. Masters, and as you say, just a horror show on the greens, you know, put him out of contention, missing the cut. Uh, hopefully, we don't get to see him this week. You know, I think you you can always expect him to put better than that because that was a, a extremely bad week there at Augusta. But it's simply, there's not much to add here other than simply the price. You know, I'm actually going to yeah. back the 50, there's 50 to 1 out there with five places. And I think it just has to be worth the gamble. I think the, uh, I've mentioned this, you know, in major podcasts here in the last couple of years that I think the fear factor and the reliability factor with Kapka and major championships has diminished over the last few years. He's left a few chances uh, slip through his fingers. Uh, and but nevertheless, he's still been there, there about. You know, he was obviously right there alongside Mickelson for a long way at KO Island last year, uh, and you know, he just he obviously I think he has roughly around a fifty percent uh, 
place record in major championships as well, which is just astonishing. So when you're getting fifty to one, and you know I'm taking what you know over ten to one the place there. Well, that's only five places, like, but you know you can get eight, eight or nine places. You know anything from thirty threes, uh, even bigger than that. So it's, it's, it just has to be a, a tempting bet. You know I was keen on him at, at Augusta, and I was maybe wrong to take that stance around the twenty to one mark. You know, looking back, I don't think it was a good selection. Uh, you know, when you've got the likes of Scotty Scheffler, who was playing, you know, undoubtedly the best golf in the world at that time. He's only a few points shorter. Maybe, you know, looking back, you know, it was a wrong decision. I would, you know, you're probably just better taking the guy who's playing the best golf in the world at a few points shorter. But now we see Bruce Cap got more than double the price. It just has to be taken on a, on a, on a major championship of this, you know, elk with this golf course. Yeah, indeed. Two more to come, uh, maybe slightly more outside the boxes. Although uh, with Daniel Berger, you've got a player who's about the same price, a little bit bigger than Brooks Kepka. He's best price, 66 to 1. Again, that's a quarter of the five for Sport Nation. Uh, 55 to 1, eight places with 365. 50 to 1, 10 places with Paddy Power and Betfair Sportsbook. Yeah, I just think the upside to Daniel Berger here is quite big. Uh, he was slightly bigger la- last night. You know, He's been back then overnight, but... Uh, I think he fits the bill of these, you know, guys, who, these Americans who haven't won a major championship. You know, we've seen the, this dominated by the Yanks over the last couple of years. And I think he's he's one who really fits the bill. He's only 29 years of age, still uh, has a lot, still has a lot of improvement in him. But uh, he just, his all-around game really suits here. You know, he's, he's not the longest off the tee nowadays, but, you know, he's slightly straighter, which helps around here you know I think it's it's going to be important to play your shots from the fairway this week I know the fairways have widened but at the same time if you miss them with the wind that, that's up it's going to be a tough uh, week for you you know he's got a great record at uh, PGA National he obviously laid there going into uh, he had a handsome lead heading into the final day and let it slip and you know he was worried. I was worried slightly that that affected him, but he's he's played he's played all right since making every, every cup, and uh, his record around PJ National is absolutely uh, is superb. He's got another couple of top five finishes there, so that's a really good uh, barometer for playing well here. I think at Southern Hills, the you know PJ National is always somewhere where you you need to keep it in the straight and narrow. It's a tough tee to green test. There's always an element of scrambling around there as well with the wind that, that usually uh, presents itself around there. So it's definitely it's definitely good to have on the CV. Mm. Uh, he was top 25 at the Heritage just after the Masters. He ranked sixth on approach that week and 13th from Tita Green. It was just a bad week on the greens that prevented him really contending that week. And uh, he's a streaky putter, and that's just what you want kind of in a major championship like this. Uh, he, he's in and out for the putting basically all season, but you know he's streaky. And uh, as I've pointed to in these over the last you know couple of years, you know a big big performances, in major championships over the la- over the previous four or five is a, is a good pointer. And you know he finished off 2021 major season with seventh at Torrey Pines and eighth at eighth at St George's. So yeah, I think he's, he's that that'll hold him in good stead. He's maybe just ready to win a major championship. I thought the performance of PJ National over the first three days was absolutely ridiculous. You know, at the Honda, I thought it was one of the best performances over the first three days we've seen all season. It was just, you know, a lead at PJ National is always slightly precarious just because it plays so difficult and it did play so difficult there on the Sunday. Uh, his conditions get getting really bad towards the end, kind of scuppering Shane Larry's chances. But, mm. uh, he rallied there even that Sunday. He was kind of out of it and got back into it at one stage. So, yeah, I think that, that'll hold him in good stead. It's, it's a great record there. And, you know, good off the tee, decent around the greens. I think, you know, he's one worth chance. And the one negative about him is that he, he pulled out of Mexico uh, with a back injury on that Monday. And mm-hmm. we haven't seen him since. So, uh, there's slight injury concern, concerns surrounding him. But nevertheless, I think he's worth chancing that if he comes here fit, you know, it's a decent price. Daniel Berger there. Um, the next for Niall in his selections, uh, one point each way. Uh, and the final selection, a player who, um, you know, I think the fact that we didn't see Ricky Fowler at Augusta says a lot about where his game has been over the last couple of years. Um, but you've seen enough 
promising signs, I'm assuming, uh, in his performance at Wells Fargo as well a couple of weeks ago to suggest he could be worth siding with at a massive price. You know, he's 200 to 1 with Unibet, who are a fifth or seven, 175 to 1 for eight places as well. Um, I think on the exchange, he's kind of pushing about 400. Um, and you think that he could be a bit of a sleeper in this uh, USPJ field? Yeah, I think he's worth chancing. Uh, you know, his form hasn't been, you know, obviously he's recovering slightly over, over the last 10 months or so. Uh, you know, his game was in an awful state there for a long time. But nevertheless, you know, you go back to October and uh, he led the CJ Cup after three days, the one that McElroy won mm. uh, in the desert. He finished third there in the end, but he led after three days. And, you know, that was one of the, you know, on any given week that could still happen with Ricky Fowler. Uh, he played quite well through the bag there at Wells Fargo last time out, finishing 21st. Uh, I think it's interesting that uh, he's kind of swapped the accuracy for distance this season. Uh, he averaged 297 off the tee last year, and he's currently averaging 310 this year. An increase of 13 yards was was as a fur increase. He, he's he's ranking currently 19th in driving distance this season. Uh, so when the rest of his game lands, I think. You know, there could be a big upside to his price and one that I'm just slightly keeping an eye on because he's obviously well vexed and well experienced in these type of championships. And, you know, he's what he's he's won big events. So I think when the rest of his game, you know, maybe meets, you know, that that increase in dis- distance off the tee, it could result in a big result. And we've obviously seen there at the CJ Cup, that's what that's what mm. could happen. He finished eighth here at Cave Island last year off the back of two missed cuts. At the Wells Fargo and Brett and the Baron Nelson. Now he's coming in obviously after a top twenty-five at the Wells Fargo, uh, and I think obviously one another element that I'm thinking of this week is the wind. He's obviously a great wind player. He's proven that down the years, you know, at Open Championships and other events. Uh, so yeah, I'm just gambling on maybe conditions being tough and wind being a, a fair factor over the first three days and. You know, if he can lead the CJ Cup, which was one of the strongest fields you you can see, uh, then you know who's to say it's happen in a major championship around the two hundred to one more. Those are the six selections uh, for Nile uh, this weekend. I'll just run through them quickly again before we have a look at some of the other um, runners and riders at the top end of the market. Two point five points each way. Smith three points win. Rory McIlroy, 1.5 each way. Will Zalatoris, 1.5 each way. Brooks Kepka, 1 point each way. Daniel Berger, and 0.75 each way. Ricky Fowler, um, do download the app and you can find uh, Niles right up and his preview ahead of this weekend's tournament there. Um, but before we let you go, Niall, get back to, uh, to either childcare duties or or uh, writing the preview, delete where, <laughs> whichever one is applicable. Um, let's look at the top end of the market. We've got two joint favourites in the form of, of John Rahm and Scotty Scheffler. Uh, you mentioned Scheffler was playing the best golf in the world going into Augusta. Uh, who's playing the best golf in the world going into uh, into this weekend? Yeah, well, I, I, I really consider John Rahm, to be honest. Uh, I thought his performance in Mexico was, you know, obviously it was in a slightly weaker field than he, you know, he's accustomed to winning recently, but... Uh, I think it's. A, I think it was a decent effort, and you know there's plenty of power putts coming down the stretch and on the Saturday there that he managed to hold, and that was the big question marks around him. Ram over recent months, uh, his short game was in bad nick, but you know his long game has always been in ridiculous form. You know it's so mm. good, it's unbelievable. So he must hold every chance. I just thought that a slightly narrower, slightly tougher test off the tee. Would have suited Ram more this week, where, where he would be able to separate himself from the field, you know, off the tee. He obviously, tops the strokes gained tee to green rankings, which is, you know, will will play a big part during the week. But I think if the test had been slightly tougher off the tee and slightly narrower, maybe, you know, he would be able to separate himself from the field slightly easier. Uh, the reason why I don't uh, invest Scotty Scheffler is simply because. I mentioned something at the Masters where I thought it was a step too far. Surely this is another step too far. <laughs> you know, is he going to go and win again? But you know, he obviously has a talent too, and he could easily, you know, win a cup, a couple of majors in that sport, like some golfers have done. Mm. 
in recent years, like the likes of Spice and Kapka. Uh, but the wind blowing this week was the most thing that put me off. Uh, not saying that he can't cope with it, but maybe we just don't have enough evidence that you know his game would suit that type of uh, condition. So uh, just at the price, I thought, uh, with the conditions that we'll see this week, it was enough to put me off. But uh, Ram, I would have had slight favour over Schaffer. A couple of others, because Roy McIlroy is next on the list, but at 16 to 1 and 18, you went to 1, we've got two golfers who you put up a fair few times. Uh, Justin Thomas, who was your selection for the Masters and had a, a torrid time on the Thursday. And then, of course, Jordan Spieth, who comes into this in scintillating form. Uh, and he's 18 to 1. And I, I messaged you yesterday because he's been put up by a few people. Um, someone else on this call may, may well have backed him as well. Uh, and I, I just assumed that he would be on the list, given his form recently. Um, but you said no, not, not at the prices. Um, so 18 to 1, not big enough for you to get involved in uh, in Jordan. Yeah, uh, he's obviously still got some putting issues. Like, you know, he's especially short putting, which yeah. would, would concern me this week. That, you know, uh, the amount of scrambling that we'll have around the greens, that there will be an awful lot of putts, you know, inside, you know, around the 5 to 10 feet mark for par. Not that he, he can overcome that easy, to be fair. You know, he wanted... Uh, he wanted to hurt his putting really poorly. You know what I mean? It's, I, it's nice, he, was, he was 72 out of 72 on straight games putting on the weekend, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, it was an astonishing effort. And, <laughs> you know, obviously, same with play. You know, his game wasn't quite there at the Masters, but he didn't put well either. But, you know, he putted better, obviously, last week at the Baron Nelson, but it wasn't, you know, that tough a test. Uh, just doesn't quite convince me that his game is on the level of winning a major championship. You know, when you win a major championship, it has to be almost a career week. You know, you need to play the, the best golf of your of your career, basically, to win one of these. And it just doesn't seem quite there yet for me, for Spieth. And I would rather wait until, you know, we get a slightly better price. You know, around fourth favourite just doesn't quite sit with me. I would I would like a bigger price this week. Simple as that. That's the reason why I texted you that you know I'm not getting involved. And I can't wait to get a text from you Thursday afternoon saying, "Do you know what, mate? I'm on." I'm on. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard. It's it's hard not to be. And when I was away on holiday last week, I was following him closely. Obviously, yeah. I'm a massive fan. But uh, yeah, it's it's just simply the price for me. I'm not saying he can't do it, but uh, I would like a bigger price. Or with the conditions that we're going to see this week, I think it's going to be tough. I'll just sl- puts me off slightly around getting involved with those prices. But there's no doubt he's playing good golf and the changes that he's made in the swing, you know, he's proved a lot of people wrong, I think. And uh, well, I mean, I, Watching his pre-shot routine it is basically exactly what I try not to do when I'm playing golf myself. So it's quite yeah. weird to watch him basically deliberately coming over the top every time. And then and then yeah. it doesn't really seem to... It's almost as if he's drilling himself to, to not do that because the swing itself doesn't seem to have any resemblance to the pre-shot routine. It's bizarre. Yeah. Yeah, and a lot of people were saying that obviously when it started there a number of weeks ago too. But you know his results have been superb, and, and yeah. especially from Tita Green, which is what we're talking about here with that mm. swing. Uh, his Tita Green efforts have been excellent. So he obviously holds every chance, and with you know short game being a big aspect this week, you know he could come up trumps and and, and obviously do it. But you know he's going for the Grand Slam too, which is a tremendous pressure uh, for him, and you know. Whether his putting will hold up under that kind of pressure is a, is a, is a big question, Mark. JT? Yeah, I entered my considerations too, obviously, just simply because the correlation I put between this place and Augusta. Uh, great off tight lays around greens, you know, one of the best chippers around the greens. So, and obviously, from Tita Green, he's excellent too. One of the best approach players in the game, which will prove important hitting greens this week if you can hit. The greens in regulation around 70%, you'll, you'll have a huge chance this week. So, uh, yeah, and there's consideration again, but around the same prices, I just really like Rory McIlroy. That mm. was my, that was, I didn't really want to take two of them. I'm, I'm back at Smith because I think he's an excellent price, but uh, towards the top of the market, I just preferred McIlroy simply because of the, the golf that he's playing. He's playing as good as the rest of them, from tee to green especially, if not better. And uh, you know, I just think it was a slight turning point at Augusta. Well, I'm hoping it was anyway. And yeah, the prices just preferred Rory at the top. But any single one of those top five golfers, there's no, there's no real negatives surrounding them. So 
they will have a, will be popular among many this week. And uh, yeah, it's just a personal personal preference, I guess, who you go for from the top. Yeah, I'll rattle off a couple more names, and you can pick out. We won't go through all of them. You can pick out any that you have anything to add on. Kind of going down to Salatorius, who's who's forty to one in the market. So these are all the players. And we've just gone through from the top end down to to forty to one. You've got um, well, you know, two of the best iron players in the game in Colin Morikawa at twenty to one, Patrick Cantlay twenty two to one, uh, Dustin Johnson twenty eight to one. I mean, drifting to it must be the biggest number he's been for a major for a very very long time. Uh, Xander Shoffley, of course, had an, an incredible round on Sunday evening. Uh, Victor Hovland, who I think the um, you know the short game requirements might mean that 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 thirty to one. May not appeal to too many, but of course, you know, he is certainly a player who's knocking on the door for his first major championship. Hideki Matsuyama's hitting the ball, I would say, with his irons as, as well as anyone in the in, in world golf at the moment, 33 to 1. Shane Lowry, another player who you'd think the conditions and the course fit could really suit at 33. Surprise, maybe, no, nothing to do with him being your compatriot, but just surprise, maybe, given everything that you've said about this weekend, given the fact that you, you bat Shari, Lowry for the Masters. And he played very well there. That you haven't uh, looked to get on board with him at kind of twenty-eight, thirty-three to one. Yeah, I backed him at the Masters at sixty-sixes. That's the only thing that puts me off. I think the game really suit the course will really suit Shane Larry, and he's playing some of the best golf of his career. You know, but it's a general price of basically twenty-eight to one out there, and mm. you know, thirty-three to one's you know six places. The price just doesn't interest me. He can win, and he has he's the capability of winning this. Uh, his game is perfect for it, but. Simply the price put me off. I won't get involved around 20 at the one. Around similar odds, I thought that Dekadi Matsuyama was a much better bet playing great golf, played well last week again. Uh, has a perfect game for uh, perfect game for Southern Hills. So yeah, I think he'll go well. You mentioned Hovland there, and that was one who came into my considerations. I think they're around the 20 at the one marks quite mm. tempted for him. Hovland is, is you know, a generational golfer too. Like, you know, I think he'll go down and prove and win multiple major championships uh, when the time is right. And when he takes one good week around the greens or one good week putting, and that'll be his major landed. And uh, he's great from tee to green as well. Obviously, he's a local boy here too. And I think uh, I was tempted by him also. Plenty, plenty are saying, you know, obviously the chipping around the greens will, will scupper them this week. But if he hits enough greens, He'll gain enough from Tita Green that he'll have a significant advantage, and then, you know, it's obviously just uh, it's obviously just a case of holding enough putts and scrambling well over the over the weekend. So, uh, yeah, he interested me. Hovland and Matsuyama were the two around that price that uh, were very close to making the mark. Uh, I think around forty to one, Matthew Fitzpatrick's interesting too, playing great golf lately. Uh, has the game to play around here? Will be great from Tita Green. Won't miss many greens, you know. He's obviously he's he's won around uh, Valderrama, which is a very tough uh, course tee to green, also. Uh, but yeah, he's playing good golf, and I think uh, you know around the forty to one, he'll have his backers too. Quite surprised, Joaquin Neiman. He's another whose major record isn't quite doesn't quite you know hit the heights that you would expect. Uh, been disappointing so far in majors, really. Uh, has a great game for this as well. Has one has improved as. His short game to no ends this season, uh, and obviously has a great tee to, green game, tee to green game too, which he showed at Riviera. So, yeah, there's a few around that mark that you could back. Uh, not an awful lot of outsiders or hundred to one plus shots, which we've seen win the major, which we've seen we've seen win the PGA down the years. Uh, there's not an awful lot that uh, interests me this week, which is surprising. I bet one. Should I tell you who it is, and then you can tell me why it's a bad bet? Yeah. Tradition. I back Christian Bezaden, who 125 to one is my only. Yeah, well, I certainly price. looked at him. I certainly looked at him yesterday. He plays with the the, the tough courses quite well. I was Leopard Creek too, so uh, yeah, he's certainly one who came into uh, my consideration. I just wanted a the, the only thing that put me off was not a big major championship effort before. Mm. Uh, you know, if he had a played in the last few groups at one of them, you know, recently. He would have been really high up my list at that kind of price. But, uh, yeah, I'll maybe just look for uh, one good effort on a major before getting involved. I feel like when you used to slag off my um, my selections, they used to play quite well. And since you've been getting on board with them, they're all rubbish. So <laughs> I wish it had gone the other way. 
Uh, cheers, Niall, for sharing your thoughts and taking time out and what's obviously quite a stressful time at the moment uh, to talk us through your picks. Do download the Odd Checker app to see Niall's tips straight there as well as the best prices and bookie offers and tips across all sport as well. Fingers crossed for a, a massive week at Southern Hills, an entertaining week and hopefully a profitable week for Niall and his followers as well. As is always the case, please do gamble responsibly.